Un sistema dinamico, interattivo, accessibile. Un flusso inarrestabile di informazioni scorre nel nostro quotidiano. Milioni di persone ogni giorno vogliono sapere, aggiornarsi, conoscere. Siamo tutti connessi in un battito di tasto. Per noi le parole hanno un peso, vanno scelte con cura. Questo è il nostro impegno quotidiano, verità e correttezza per rispettare le idee e i fatti e soprattutto le persone. Noi abbiamo scelto di raccontare la realtà con un linguaggio corretto, semplice, coerente, perché portiamo avanti un'idea positiva e propositiva, rivolta a tutti, perché crediamo in un mondo migliore e nel bene comune, perché dietro le notizie ci sono le storie e dentro le storie sempre le persone. Ed è questo che ci rende unici. Per noi le parole hanno un peso, ma anche le altre. Ecco direttore, grazie. Per volare oltre pregiudizi, oltre i confini della discriminazione, per superare gli ostacoli del cuore e della mente, per oltrepassare la paura e la superficialità, per vedere e comprendere ciò che è lontano ma che è più vicino di quanto non immaginiamo, perché è la nostra storia ciò che leggiamo. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Benvenuti. Good afternoon and welcome to welcome to this uh, meeting Europe and the future, the first important step of uh, uh, the path that we are going to follow here at the meeting on European policies. And I would like to introduce our guests, Paolo Gentiloni, a great friend of the meeting, European Commissioner for Economic Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Gentiloni, for being here with us. And then we have Elena Mazzola, who is the president of 
the uh, Ukraine ONG emails cases. And uh, I would uh, like to thank Ellen as well for being here with us this afternoon. Then we will have a video message by Roberta Mezzola, who is the president of the European Parliament. So just a few words of introduction. I have three uh, groups of questions I would like to ask to uh, Mr. Gentilone after Elena will have presented the situation in Ukraine. So peace and the political uh, structure in uh, uh, some European electoral campaigns, uh, I often had to say, explain to young people what, why is uh, uh, Europe so important? Because uh, what actually puts us uh, on the same level uh, in comparison uh, to previous uh, generation is that we had never witnessed a war. So a united Europe has uh, made it possible for us uh, to have a Europe that is uh, free, uh, war free. So uh, Adenauer uh, and all the other founding fathers uh, put together uh, the uh, energy sources uh, in order to guarantee peace. And this is uh, something that uh, has uh, given the idea of a European Union which is free from war. And then there was the uh, war in the former Yugoslavia, which in a way showed that uh, that war broke out in a region of Europe that did not belong to this uh, peace agreement. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the enlargement towards East, um, we thought that uh, war would no longer be present in Europe. Now we have a war which is not only a war between Russia and Ukraine, but it is uh, something that shows us that uh, um, European nation can actually attack another nation. nation. Dozens of thousands of uh, people dying on uh, the European uh, territory. And uh, so the first question I would like to ask to Commissioner Gentiloni is the following. How will this uh, change the idea of Europe? We will be going back to the East-West relationship, uh, the one we used to have in the past. What does this mean for the Mediterranean? And uh, what does uh, this mean for uh, uh, Europe uh, as uh, a place of peace? This uh, division, uh, this uh, uh, chasm with Russia is something we can actually overcome. Then we have a second uh, question. These are very general questions I'm asking, uh, but I'm trying to voice uh, the uh, questions that everybody has at the moment. Last year, we had the great uh, French economist Fitoussi, who uh, passed away this year, who is, uh, was one of the greatest uh, experts in terms of inequality. And he said uh, that our system was based on two uh, notions, one of a democracy, one citizen, one vote, and uh, that of the market, one euro, one vote. So if this second model prevails, uh, democracy is in jeopardy. So well, we have uh, seen the, how inequalities and differences have been increasing over the last few years in terms of, for instance, wages. And uh, there was uh, some kind of uh, um, trend towards uh, liberalism, uh, and at a world level, uh, the uh, GDP is uh, now $75,000 billion, whereas uh, the global financial activity uh, has been estimated at $993,000 billion. So there is a great difference. Let's think about the, finan the financial crisis in 2008, which is not over in terms of its effects at the moment. So something happened 
In 2017, the uh, member states of uh, the European Union committed themselves to a more social Europe. So this is a an incredibly important moment because uh, uh, the next generation EU was introduced because uh, there are so many different elements that make up this uh, new structure. So what is the future of Europe from this point of view? This is uh, due to the fact that we have always thought about the uh, relation between uh, public debt and GDP, but now we are moving towards a social Europe, uh, something that is a part of our uh, being, um, or are we uh, going towards more liberalism? So what is uh, the future of uh, Europe going to be in terms of uh, economy? And then subsidiarity, horizontal subsidiarity, and uh, we have a report uh, of the year 2022 that shows that when we uh, commit ourselves in the third sector in uh, social uh, in the social sphere the uh, unemployment rate goes down education goes up and uh, the uh, in general people can live a better life so my first question is will europe take this into account, will Europe be uh, the Europe of peoples rather than Europe of states? Because it is very difficult to actually um, deal with this. Then there is another question that uh, goes back to the roots of Europe. Uh, I have uh, studied that the Maastricht Treaty is based on uh, vertical uh, subsidiarity. That is to say, states can actually take decisions. They have priority uh, over uh, the European Union. What does this mean? By enlarging Europe, uh, this means that uh, uh, we need unanimity to take decisions within the European Union because uh, uh, the subsidiarity principle uh, goes against any other form of decision making, but this unanimity goes against the interests of our people. We can no longer take decisions in uh, many different uh, spheres, uh, fiscal and uh, uh, health and so many other aspects, and uh, this can actually lead to a situation of a constant stalemate, and this is something that can paralyze our people. So my third question is based on this concept of horizontal subsidiarity, and also how can we take into account of both the principle of sovereignty and that of unanimity. And this is one of the fundamental themes of the electoral campaign. I've been asked what is the meeting going to do for the electoral campaign. Well, it will actually highlight some problems so that people can take informed decisions when they're going to vote. So uh, this is actually uh, the most important uh, element in terms of freedom of choice. So before um, giving the floor to Paolo Gentiloni and uh, to the video message by Roberta Mezzola, we would like to ask Elena what is uh, going on uh, for our uh, Ukraine friends. So Elena's uh, intervention will be uh, extremely important because it uh, actually uh, deals with so many different aspects of our lives. The president of the Italian Constitutional Court, D'Amato, said a few days ago, when I was a politician, uh, we used to discuss uh, about uh, local problems as well as world problems. So we uh, cannot uh, live our lives uh, if we do not care about uh, the uh, theme of world peace. Elena, you have the floor. Buongiorno. Um, dunque, io... Good afternoon. Um, I'm not really at ease uh, here because... Um, well, 
I don't feel I am uh, that I have the, the, the skills and the experience to talk uh, uh, with uh, someone with the commission, uh, like a commissioner Gentilone. So I will just introduce myself. I've lived uh, in uh, Russia, in Moscow for 15 years. I have a literary background. I'm a translator, and uh, so this is what I work uh, with. I've been uh, living in Kharkiv for 15 years, uh, for five years, uh, with a, a city that unfortunately everybody has heard of. In Ukraine, well, I, I can, I'm still doing my work as a translator, but uh, we also have, uh, together uh, with other uh, friends, we have uh, founded a small ONG, ONG that has what's called the EMOS, and uh, it has a very important uh, task. We help orphans, we help uh, people with health problems uh, in finding their place in the world, in uh, their place in society. I've uh, fled uh, from uh, the war with um, with my friends. We realized there was something wrong in uh, January, uh, something that was uh, unusual. Kharkiv is uh, near the border uh, to Russia, near Belgrade. The uh, tanks at the border and uh, everything that was going on in Donbass. Uh, because actually war in Ukraine didn't start this year. Ukraine was occupied in 2014. And for people living, living in Ukraine, there's nothing new. When we talk about denazification, that is something that we are familiar with. Uh, we were already familiar with in the past, in January, when we understood mainly because of the uh, messages sent out by the United States that the situation was really serious. We uh, tried to escape. We, I've sent many uh, young people to Italy before the war broke out, and we really uh, fled something evil, something that was a threat, a very plausible threat. against every single human being. There were obviously um, different uh, points of view. There were different situations. Uh, there were different uh, powers at stake. Uh, that was uh, obvious, but we knew that no one was going to defend us. So. Um, Fleeting this evil, as I always say, how did you realize that the danger was uh, real? How did you manage to uh, escape in time? You had a very good strategy, people tell me. Well, uh, we didn't have uh, much more information than any other uh, uh, person in Ukraine at the time, but we were uh, sure. Uh, and I'm talking about myself and uh, my friends, that we loved uh, the young people we were working with and uh, that we did not want for them who already had very difficult lives because they are orphans. They have already been abandoned by their uh, parents. We didn't want for them to be victims again. So uh, this is how we actually manage to understand the situation, maybe sooner than many others. Uh, since we arrived in Italy, and well, there is uh, something that uh, it's, it's a very important message. War in Ukraine is not over. The situation in Ukraine hasn't improved. 
when I arrived in Italy at the beginning of March, I immediately realized that uh, people in Italy were really shocked. They were traumatized as if they had experienced our pain firsthand. Then, for many different reasons, um, as time passed, things started to change. And now we have the impression that this war is something that belongs to the past, in a way. But it, this is not true. On the contrary, the situation is even worse now than it used to be a couple of months ago. Tonight, for instance, uh, at uh, 3 a.m., three friends of mine, three uh, very, very brave women working for Immos, arrived here in Rimini by car. They uh, drove a car that we have bought for one of our uh, um, girls. This car had been hit by a bomb. They repaired the car and they drove to Rimini in order to participate in the meeting. After months of bombing in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, in Kharkiv and in other uh, towns and cities, Olya, one of uh, these uh, three women, used to have a, a cafe in uh, Kharkiv that uh, was completely destroyed at the beginning of the war. So, well, I have uh, actually heard of so many stories uh, similar to this one. And the, when my one of my friends, uh, Katya, tells me that she's fine in Ukraine, I know that she lives in Kharkiv in her own home. She has to run to the uh, shelters uh, when uh, the uh, bomb, sh bomb attacks us. Thought. And this is something that happens all the time. I know that there are many people in Italy that are uh, um, sheltering Ukrainians. We have actually uh, managed to uh, welcome um, over 150 people here in Italy. I know that the Pope, to whom I am profoundly grateful, condemns the war with the strong words. It talks about cruelty. It talks about a tragedy. And it, we should ask ourselves, what am I doing for the Ukrainian people? I'd really like to invite everyone to look at the individuals. You, war is in Europe. There are uh, uh, thousands of people like us who live, for instance, all of my friends and, well, myself as well, me, myself as well, uh, live their life knowing that they have uh, friends and relatives uh, that could be victims of bombs in Ukraine. And then must, one last thing, our uh, two, uh, two things I would like to add. Uh, uh, well, the young people that uh, came to Italy with me are um, working as volunteers here at the meeting in Rimini. Perché? Perché per me è importante dirlo? Why do I believe this is important? Because uh, the Ukrainian people need help. A lot of people fled, leaving everything behind because of a terrible injustice. We've lost everything. We need help. We need houses. We need friends. We 
we don't need an approach an approach based on a general act of support. We need to be seen as persons. So uh, together with our young people, with all of the Ukrainians that are here with us, uh, we uh, are uh, profoundly interested in uh, carrying on our work with our dignity and uh, uh, our uh, young people who uh, uh, they don't want people uh, telling them oh we're sorry for you uh, we can help you no they're here they are uh, working as volunteers because we do believe that by creating uh, this uh, new idea of uh, a person uh, Ukraine could actually restart. And uh, uh, here is a little uh, kind of advertisement I would like to make. As I said, I'm mes uh, I work in the field of literature, Emosa, Emosa and my um, young friends are part of my life, but my job is something else. And I wrote a book on Alessandro Manzoni that you can find here in our bookshop here at the meeting, which is called Manzoni between Moscow and Kiev. I've often been asked, sometimes in a very blunt way, uh, what do I think about uh, forgiveness? So uh, we need to forgive because it's only by forgiving that we can start again. But this is a very serious question because um, if uh, I go to someone who is a victim of rape, who is being killed, and I talk to this person about forgiveness, I do not contribute to the cause of peace. So, well, this is the problem from my point of view. I need to understand how I, as a person, can recognize that we can live in this world only if we love and if we could forgive. And this is what uh, you will find in this uh, book, because in the latest months, I have uh, found out many important questions. One is that of uh, forgiveness, which is a, a theme that is extremely important in Alessandro Mazzoni's work by reading the uh, Christian literature. So re reading and starting again the work of uh, by Alessandro Manzoni, I understood this concept of uh, forgiveness, which is, uh, according to Alessandro Manzoni, linked to the uh, person of Jesus Christ who let us uh, live. I have done nothing special. And I have found uh, um, a way to look at people. And this is what I wish for, for uh, the young people we're helping. Thank you. Let's now give the floor to the President of the European Parliament through her video message and then we'll hear Paolo Gentiloni. Dear friends of the meeting, it's a great pleasure and honor to join the 43rd edition of the meeting. Over the years, these events 
has become more and more an important occasion for dialogue and friendship. We are going through uncertain times of uh, unplanned challenges, and after two years of pandemic, we are still going through heavy social and economic consequences. And then Putin sparked off uh, an illegal war against an independent and sovereign Ukraine. So Russian bombs uh, uh, killed people with no distinction. Uh, women were raped and millions of Ukrainians had to flee the country, finding refuge in Europe, trying to find salvation for a ruthless autocrat. And while I'm saying these words, the invasion of Ukraine goes on. But still, the European Union has reacted immediately, providing humanitarian, military and financial aid uh, that were of unprecedented nature. We showed solidarity to the Ukrainian people, imposing heavy sanctions against Putin and uh, his allies. And we also assigned to Ukraine the official status of a candidate to the EU. And this was a historical decision. We have remained united because we know that uh, the Ukrainian citizens are fighting not just for their country, but also to preserve the values that are the very heart and basis of our way of living, of freedom, democracy, and rule of law. They know that the European project uh, uh, relying on the desire to guarantee peace, prosperity, and stability, and freedom in Europe is the driving force uh, preventing the past uh, on which uh, Putin power is based, uh, that is based on the Arab Curtain <coughs> and vassal states. The world after February the 24th is different, certainly a more dangerous one. And uh, even the role of Europe has changed. So the war at our doorstep had heavy consequences also for EU citizens. The shortage of uh, uh, food supplies and the surge of energy prices are putting us to the test. But still, we need to remain united now more than ever. We need each other heavily, strongly because uh, we can overcome these challenges only together. So it is up to us uh, to defend uh, the values uh, we believe in. It is up to us uh, to consolidate uh, relationships between and among countries and people and nations, because we're all proud of our differences, but we understand that the future can be faced only together. It's not about reinventing the wheel. We can complete each other and be complementary to each other through the existing alliances. We need to respond in a united way, but at the same time with a deep sense of hope, because multilateral cooperation is the only way to go. Democracy has to prevail on uh, authoritarian regimes in order to make Europe to preserve its project. So when it comes to hope, this is not just about a naive optimism. Has Václav Havel tells us, reminds us, you devoted to him a beautiful exhibition in the 2019 American edition. So hope is not a conviction that what we're doing will be successful. Hope is a certainty that what we're doing has a meaning, has a purpose, regardless of its outcome. So hope is not a prediction. It's an orientation and an attitude of the heart and of the mind. So we are here in Rimini, and this is a proof of our resistance and resilience of Europe. Well, the pandemic did not stop you, and by fully complying with all the sanitary rules, you were able to organize the May thing with the same enthusiasm and ever, because you commit yourselves to putting people at the heart of Europe. And this is a reformation of the political role of truth. The European Parliament, the home of European democracy, Democracy shares with you a passion for the person. And this is the passion of the people who care for the future of uh, individuals. It's not about having being scared about the future, not at all. It's about uh, trying to face those challenges up front. And this is also my main uh, 
goal and priority as president of the European Parliament. My hope and wish is that the EU member states and the citizens together will play an active role when it comes to the debate on the Europe of the future of Europe. So society can play a key role in that respect. The European Parliament wants to uh, listen to the voices of people from different walks of life. So if you come up with the proposals and solutions, well, you will be part of the conversation and your voice will be heard. This is my message for you. Thank you. Thank you to the President. Thank you to all the collaborators of the Meiji Foundation for the friendship among the people and thanks to the thousands of uh, volunteers uh, that uh, come from any part of Italy and of the world uh, to join the meeting. Europe needs to remain a place of freedom, hope, and solidarity. So this is going to be Europe that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much and have a fruitful meeting. And now the floor goes to the European Commissioner, Paolo Gentiloni. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome and good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the meeting for the kind invitation also this year. And uh, I'm very happy to take the floor after the nice words expressed by the European Parliament President, uh, Roberta Mezzola, and I see this opportunity to remember her predecessor, a great Italian, David Sassoli. And I'm happy that today's uh, meeting about uh, the future of Europe started by talking about uh, Kharkiv, Ukraine, Emos, and I think that nothing but the war in Ukraine can uh, remind us of the difficult times we're going through. We need to uh, really use that as a springboard to start a new reflection. So what times are we living in? Well. We are certainly living through uncertain times. This is certainly a key word, uncertainty, that applies to so many things. But it is, we also need to rediscover and come to terms uh, with uh, our, I mean, weaknesses, because uh, people have considered themselves as uh, the masters of the world. Uh, and to be dominating the world through technology and not only. So man is no god at all. And war reminds us that uh, deeply and strongly. And Europe and the European project were the result of the strong rejection of any form of war. But that uh, rejection is never final. A, a great uh, German chancellor, Helmut Kohl, at the French National Assembly once said, and these words seem to be words for today. And Helmut Kohl said once, so evil has not been banned from Europe. Each generation will be faced with the threat of evil. So each generation has the role to prevent evil to come back. So it is up to us, but most of all to you, to prevent evil to prevail. Well, we went through deep, vulnerable times uh, because of the pandemic. People had to face uh, loneliness, solitude, and vulnerability, and we experienced that in so many places, in so many ways, and as individuals and as communities. And then we feel weak because of climate change. We feel weak because uh, there seems to be a form of democracy without freedom that seems to be rife in many countries in the world and even in Europe. So forms of democracy without freedom. So when people ask me about the meaning of Europe, well, 
I would say, first of all, that Europe is an antidote, is a response, a tool to try to cope with this sense of uh, uncertainty and weakness. Well, which Europe? Well, it's not just about rules, because we often think about rule, Europe, we think about rules and a sort of maze of rules. But, uh, well, Europe should also be the cradle of a new form of uh, humanism, as uh, Pope Francis said in 2017 when he met several leaders uh, to celebrate uh, the 60 years uh, of the uh, European founding treaties. And he said this, so a new European humanism need to see the day, the, the place of the passion for the person, so linking up with uh, this year's meeting title. So the pillars of uh, such a European demanding project are pretty clear to every one of us, I think. So there is, there are several things at stake. There is the climate challenge, there is the ecological transition that needs to go hand in hand with the social transition, because if the ecological transition won't be fair, I mean, uh, there won't be any fair social transition, and maybe this is the most difficult challenge for any government in Europe. But then there is the social dimension that is also crucial. Europe uh, actually is not fully equipped uh, with all the required tools, because when it comes to social Europe, it's more about principles than operating tools. So we need to try to overcome those limits. But let's think about the minimum wage. That is a topic that actually resulted from Europe in spite of all the difficulties and specificities. So minimum wages have landed in Italy and in other countries. Then uh, uh, there were subsidies uh, for redundant people and workers. So everybody is talking about the uh, resilience and uh, recovery plan. But actually, I proposed that uh, in April 2020 with a, a sort of redundant uh, subsidy plan. And uh, so many workers uh, were able, thanks to that, not to lose their job because of the pandemic. And then there is another dimension that has to do with uh, uh, rights, civil rights, uh, social rights, sexual rights, religious rights. Uh, we want to be the land of freedom. But in order to achieve all this, we need first and foremost uh, to take up today's challenge for Europeans. This challenge is related to economic hardships, inflation is going up and up, has never been so high, and uh, so economic growth is slowing down. Fortunately, with no repercussions yet on the employment market and energy costs that are really surging and they are becoming very difficult for households and the vulnerable people, but also for businesses. And when I'm asked what are governments doing to go with this energy crisis, well, usually we suggest, I mean, uh, governments to take targeted and temporary measures. Well, these measures need to be temporary based because we can't, I mean, uh, somehow hinder the sort of ecological transition that needs to be smoothed. So we still need to use uh, fossil fuels uh, in a limited way. But at the same time, we need to help uh, people in need, the neediest ones, because uh, uh, low-income people, so uh, that are struggling to, I mean, uh, 
uh, reach the end of the month. And uh, the impact of energy costs have become so high, so energy costs have almost doubled for everybody. And they are particularly heavy for the most vulnerable and uh, disadvantaged people. So we need to protect uh, the, I mean, most disadvantaged people at the same time trying to do the best not to stop economic growth and ecological transition. And then there is next generation EU, the cross-cutting and wide EU recovery plan. So it's so good. I mean, if it wasn't there, we should invent it because it is really somehow working as a driving force today. It is supporting and sustaining uh, economic growth and development uh, and uh, the job market. So trying to somehow stimulate uh, economies is very good. And uh, this uh, program is key because it's not just about uh, giving money away, not at all. It's about uh, you spending money for specific goals uh, that aim at promoting and fostering our uh, economic future and our social future. So this recovery plan is really strategic and fundamental. And uh, well, the EU is being put to a test, uh, literally, and the uh, EU issuing is really a historical decision. And I think that uh, Italy is going really to be at the forefront when it comes to this test because uh, the European success will be largely determined by our own success. So if Italy will be successful in its plan, well, the EU won't be successful. So our destiny goes hand in hand with EU destiny. That's why from Brussels, we like to say to all countries that right now, right here in such difficult economic times, we need to keep going. We need to face the inflation surge. We need to face the uh, energy cost rise. We need uh, somehow to try to keep going in spite of all that. And in spite of this contradictory picture, we really need to implement the recovery plan. And we need to do it now. We need to speed up. We should not at all rethink everything and starting from scratch again. Not at all. We need to speed up the pace. And if there is something that is targeted and needs to be adjusted and slightly changed, so doors in Brussels are always open to that kind of correctional work, just for limited and small adjustments, little touch-ups, and not to rethink from scratch a plan on which the whole EU destiny depends. So again, my message is very clear in that respect. So stormy seas need to be faced now. And uh, even high debt countries like ours need to do that and to do so through the recovery plans. And we are not doomed to face austerity because uh, considering the debt problems uh, of some high debt countries, well, people think that austerity is uh, inevitable. Well, we need to be cautious when it comes to financial policy, but our plan foresees 40 billions of investments for development per year that are strictly related to reforms. So it's not at all about austerity, and the plan has already generated uh, meaningful results. Today, a report was published by Sole 24 Ore showing the large increase uh, of uh, contracts uh, over the last few months. So it's a race against time, and uh, all the people 
who know Italy and uh, intermediary bodies know how it is difficult to implement such plans when it comes to bureaucracy and red tape. There are so many steps to go through, so it's a race against time. And uh, so we have no time to lose. And uh, in particular, there is so much at stake. It's uh, not about austerity, it's about development. So we really can't afford to stop, not even for a second. If little adjustments are needed, okay, but they need to keep going and not restart from scratch. And Vittadini, Mr. Vittadini, well, asked himself and asked me about the role of the EU in more general terms. Well, we love Europe. I'm a huge European fan and I'm a big Europe supporter. And with me, so many other people. And unfortunately, sometimes we are not able to welcome new member states uh, as we would wish, but, uh, well, we started uh, with a very uh, sort of a limited uh, number of countries, uh, so, and uh, we moved from six uh, to 27, and uh, 20 uh, country from January, Croatia in the European Union, so we will have more than 350 million euros of European citizens, million European citizens say so we love Europe. The Europe of, uh, I mean, uh, coffee shops, uh, as George Steiner used to say, but coffee shops differ so much in Europe, so we have uh, different settings for coffee shops. They, they change, they're so diverse and vary so much, but coffee shops are a sort of uh, feel rouge connecting uh, Europe. And Europe is a sort of, uh, I mean, calm superpower, Tommaso, uh, Tommaso Padoscata said. Some talked about Venus versus Mars, and many defined Europe as a herbivore creature surrounded by carnivore creatures. I don't know which is the right definition, but I think that those who love Europe for the values it stands for, the welfare state, freedom, well, those people loving Europe so much can not be contempt with, uh, I mean, the Europe of uh, Nachtimbos, uh, of uh, those people who somehow were called the sleepwalkers of uh, 1912, 1913s, people who saw what was happening but were caught by surprise by war and didn't, didn't do anything to prevent that war from happening. So the risk of the sleepwalkers is still there. It's there now more than ever. So when it comes to the future, I would like to answer to you, Mr. Vitadini, with just a few key words. So Europe needs not to be an observer, but to play an active role because there is nobody else around like the EU. I mean, the EU is unique. Even the United States are based on a different uh, model, especially in terms of welfare state. There's nothing like the EU in the world. No other entity that can show the same level of social economy, of freedom, and uh, individual protection that exists in Europe. And we need to keep going with that project with uh, a strong presence on the international scenario. We can't simply celebrate uh, the fact of being uh, the biggest uh, trading power in the world and that uh, life within our borders is good with 
a good number of privileges. We need to try to play that role also at international level. And allow me to sum up with a, a little elaboration on this. What do I mean by that? First of all, we need a, a common defense policy. Having such a policy means trying to go over the unanimity principle because the unanim unanimity principle one, uh, will never allow a common defense policy and not even a common fiscal policy. I'm in charge of uh, fiscal policies and uh, say so I'm in charge of that at EU level and uh, it took us months to find an agreement to impose uh, minimum taxes for larger uh, companies in order to fight against uh, tax havens and also to tax uh, the big data powers. And there is one country, Hungary, that is blocking this agreement. And with the current system, so with the unanimity rule, we can't go on. We can't move on. We can't move over. So we strongly and desperately need a common defense policy. And I say it clearly, not because uh, the EU wants to replace uh, the NATO when it comes to the deterrent power vis-a-vis -vis Russia. It's not a job. We need a common defense policy when it comes to our role in the Mediterranean, when it comes to our relations to Africa, when it comes to, I mean, uh, those parts of the world, because, I mean, we need really to to define our attitude when it comes to those relations and also when it comes to the relations between the Europe, the Mediterranean and Africa because that part of the world will represent very soon 3 billion people. So a European defense policy means not letting authoritarian uh, I mean, uh, regimes like the state capitalism of China, free range in China, in Africa, not at all. We need uh, to be heard. We need to play our own role. And without uh, a common policy, I mean, the sum of the individual countries won't be enough. Well, I often say to uh, authorities from African countries, to what extent EU investments are important. And as a matter of fact, we play a key role in Africa if we put together all the investments made by each country. But Europe is not seen as a sort of a single entity. So we need, first of all, a common defense policy. Secondly, in order to play a global role, we need to try to better elaborate on globalization. Well, someone said that globalization is dead, is over. And it is true that some correction measures need to be adopted because we cannot look at globalization as a, a way uh, to uh, find uh, economic advantages uh, for uh, big companies. This phase is over, that is true. But now we cannot accept the idea that has been defined as friend shoring as opposed to offshoring. So globalization only among countries that are friend with each other. Well, the world is a very big place. So if we think about a situation where the West is uh, on its own as opposed to the rest of the world, well, this is a very dangerous idea. And Europe is uh, the uh, subject that can keep international relationships alive, making them fairer and 
as we have been asking for uh, the uh, products that uh, enter within uh, the uh, European uh, single market, we need to have uh, products that are fair, but uh, that do not bring the world back to nationalism. And we need economic stability. Today, it's uh, an important day because it's the end of a long period of uh, control over the Greek economy. About 10 years ago, the uh, country, Greece, was uh, experiencing a terrible economic and financial crisis. At the beginning, Europe responded uh, with me measures that involved uh, rocketing social costs. But now this is over. The uh, Financial crisis is over in this country, but we don't have to go back to that same situation. And I will be working on this in the next uh, few weeks uh, during the uh, revision of uh, the stability pact that actually, in a way, uh, um, governs the uh, European, the uh, EU economy. We need to have a pact that is based on stability, that does with uh, a certain uh, balance uh, between countries that are extremely rich and countries that are doomed to austerity. So we need to have uh, high-income countries that are cautious, but we need to uh, carry on development and investment policies. So in this context, which is uh, very ambitious, I believe that the role of Europe has changed over the years. We could say that until a few years ago, people love to say it is Europe that asks us for, for something. Well, now I prefer that people say Europe should help us solving our problems. The uh, budget of uh, the European Union is one-tenth of the Italian budget. So asking Europe to solve our problems implies a difficult uh, um, uh, path towards an agreement uh, among uh, different governments and this well this would be much easier if we didn't have uh, the unanimity rule but uh, it is uh, all right to ask more from europe uh, to have a maximum gas price for instance to lead the uh, um, green transition for instance this is exactly what we have to do we do not, we cannot be reluctant in our being Europeans. Otherwise, we are just uh, hiding nationalism. And nationalism is something that we do not need. Our uh, president of the Italian republics from Carlo Ciampi to Mattarella, all our presidents talked about a new way to love our country in a healthy way, to, to love our flag, our national anthem. These are all elements, patriotic elements, that we need to support. But, dear friends, if we do not share these patriotic feelings at European level, if this becomes a new form of nationalism where everyone solves solve their own problems, well, we would be making a big mistake. No reluctance towards Europe. 
but yes to our common European values translated into national values. Thank you. Just a, a few uh, thoughts um, as a conclusion to this uh, first meeting. Uh, first, well, in order to uh, be politicians, we need to see what is happening, what people are experiencing. We cannot ignore everyday life. We cannot ignore a war. We cannot ignore the need for peace. So this is a method that shows us how to face elections. Then my second conclusion is the following. The ideal value that seems very abstract because uh, uh, Commissioner Gentiloni's words uh, took us back to this idea that in order to face our problems, we need to be practical but also have some ideals. This makes uh, me think of the first European ideals that De Gasperi used to say that Italy was born again in Europe. So if our concrete problems are very small problems, so we cannot move forward. We need to have a passion for the person, uh, to look at the problems of, uh, for instance, energy sources, of uh, price uh, increases, inflation, and uh, um, economic and financial aid. Otherwise, we would be falling back into nationalism. So the interest of a, every single country is uh, uh, given uh, um, prevalence to, uh, with uh, in respect to to the uh, interests of the whole of Europe. So this problem of uh, the vertical subsidiarity, the problem of uh, the power of a, of a country, of its uh, so sovereignty, uh, then institutions like the European Parliament have to increase in their value because uh, uh, a European Parliament that gives voice to the people and that can complement the questions of the Commission by taking decisions by majority, uh, respects the people and respects the principle of a sovereignty. And so those who win are those who have an ideal vision of the world. So a reform that can actually bring new value to democracy in Europe so that those who vote do have a decision-making power. So this is what we wish for. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being with us this afternoon.
tempo è il luogo della comunicazione. Un sistema dinamico, interattivo, accessibile. Un flusso inarrestabile di informazioni scorre nel nostro quotidiano. Milioni di persone ogni giorno vogliono sapere, aggiornarsi, conoscere. Siamo tutti connessi in un battito di tasto. Per noi le parole hanno un peso, vanno scelte con cura. È questo il nostro impegno quotidiano, verità e correttezza per rispettare le idee e i fatti e soprattutto le persone. Noi abbiamo scelto di raccontare la realtà con un linguaggio corretto, semplice, coerente, perché portiamo avanti un'idea positiva e propositiva, rivolta a tutti, perché crediamo in un mondo migliore e nel bene comune, perché dietro le notizie ci sono le storie e dentro le storie sempre le persone. Ed è questo che ci rende unici. Per noi le parole hanno un peso, ma anche le ali. Ecco, direttore. Grazie. Per volare oltre i pregiudizi, oltre i confini della discriminazione, per superare gli ostacoli del cuore e della mente, per oltrepassare la paura e la superficialità, per vedere e comprendere ciò che è lontano, ma che è più vicino di quanto non immaginiamo, perché è la nostra storia ciò che leggiamo.